knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. You know, the, the next verse in that particular narrative says, And then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked. I remember years ago, uh, a lady at one of the congregations we were at, she said, We need to get some of that forbidden fruit and give it to all our teenagers, because some of our teenagers need to know that they're naked sometimes. And so uh, we got a kick out of that, of hearing that uh, when she said it. She was pretty serious, I think. Uh, but But that's... We've been, this last week, I hope you have been, if you didn't get your copy of the book, there's a copy of the book, the elders bought a copy of that book for each family in the congregation. If you didn't get your copy of the book last week, if you will see some of us, we can get that to you. See one of the elders, they will get it to you, or Rod or Judd, and, and they'll get you your copy, your family's copy of that book. But we have been, if you've been following along, reading through a different devotional each day, about five or 600 words each day, about Adam and Eve and various aspects of the things that they did in their life. I think they're most famous, not necessarily for being the first humans, but for being the first ones to sin. I think that actually takes precedence. When you think of Adam and Eve, you don't think of Adam and Eve and, and tending the garden. You don't think of Adam and Eve and, and the life they were living, walking with God day by day. We think of Adam and Eve and we immediately start thinking of, Ooh, the forbidden fruit. That's the first thing that seems to come to mind. There are a lot of firsts in life. There are so many firsts. You have your first job, maybe your first car, your first home. You remember your first kiss? Remember your first child or your first grandchild or, or, or your first great-grandchild? And, and those are great memories. We have all kinds of firsts in life, and, and we celebrate various firsts in life. You know, we, we always remember the first one to do something. We always remember the first thing we did or the first time we did something and the, and, the, and the wonderful things about that. But how about first impressions? And specifically, how about our first impression of Adam and Eve, our first couple? Wonder what we think about them. What's your first impression when you think of Adam and Eve? Is it the relationship they had with God before the fall? Or is it the fall and the results of the fall? When we think of them, where do we generally think of them in their life structure? Are we judgmental to the point that we've forgotten all about the fact that they had such a close relationship with God that he walked in the evening with them? Have we forgotten all about the tending the garden? Have we forgotten all about the great things they did in their life because all we see is the sin that's flashed in front of us as we look at their lives? Again, we've been, we've been talking about there. There's, a, there's an innocence in the garden. This, this beautiful passage when man is first created says God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. And in male and female, he created them. That's the way the, the scriptures tell us about the creation of man. It says, and the man and his wife were naked after Eve is created. The man and his wife were naked, and they were not ashamed. See, there was an innocence in the garden. There was a purity in the garden. There was, a, there was an absolute lack of shame and guilt because there was nothing to be ashamed of, and there was no guilt to be had. There was no sin in the garden. We must see that as we look at the garden sometimes. Don't you wish you had that kind of relationship with God? A relationship where there is no shame, a relationship where there is no guilt, a relationship where you could, where you could come to God and speak to God and not have anything separate you from God. Wouldn't you long for that type of relationship? And we can have that through Jesus. We can. Doesn't mean we don't have sin means we can have our sin forgiven. And what a wonderful problem or, or hope that is for us as we have that. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't started reading that, 
There's five readings a week. There's a reason why they gave it to us so that we could read those and, and have family. To, what a great time. Husbands, dads, I'm, I'm challenging you right now. Oftentimes, I've had dads and husbands come to me and say, I'd like to be the spiritual leader in my home that God wants me to be. I just don't know how to get started. Here's a great way to get started. Grab the book, sit down with your family, and read the, the devotionals, and maybe talk about them a little bit. Hey, what did you think about what he said here? I promise you there'll be some things you'll disagree with. I promise you most of the things you'll agree with. And every now and then, one will raise up a question that makes you stop and think for a little bit. And what a great opportunity to take advantage of this, to spend time meditating on God's word, uh, and to grow together as families. So with these thoughts in mind, I want to go a little deeper today into the story of Adam and Eve and, and maybe try to answer a couple of questions about Adam and Eve. And I think the first question is, who sinned first? Who sinned first, Adam or Eve? You know, I think we, we're pretty clear about the idea of who sinned first because Paul writes in 1 Timothy, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So Paul's pretty clear there that the woman deceived or was deceived and she became a transgressor. But in Romans chapter 5, he writes it a different way. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. Sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of who? Adam. Sin came by one man, not by one mankind, not by one humankind, by one male man, by Adam personally, whose name is mentioned there in the text. The transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come, which he's speaking of Jesus. So if Adam sinned first, what was his sin? Have you ever thought about that? We know from the text that Adam needed Eve to help him. That was an important thing that, that God saw. Eve was created to be a helper for, for Adam. Preachers oftentimes will say something at weddings, and, and I've, I've done the same thing about how, how God made the earth, and it was perfect, and he said, it is good. And he made the animals, and he said, it is good. And he made the plants, he said, it is good. He made the sun and the moon, he said, it's good. He made the stars, and he said, it's good. And he made the man, he said, well, it's not good enough. He needs a helper. And most of us at one time or other have heard a preacher say something like that. And, 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 but maybe this lacking might be missing something a little bit as we talk about that. Because we're given a clue in Genesis chapter 2 about who the man really was. Let's look at this text again and understand a little bit about what it says here. Look what it says. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him out of the ground. The Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. While he slept, took one of his ribs, closed it up his place with flesh. The rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. You know, mankind, both male and female, were the height of God's creation. All of creation was good, even mankind. And, and I think sometimes we might forget there a little bit about that. There was nothing wrong with the man when God made the man. There was nothing wrong with it. It was just not right for him to be all alone. You know, one of the... One of the saddest things, one of the most depressing things in the world is to be all alone. Now, I know some of you are like I am, and you say, well, I, I covet time that I can be alone a little bit. You know, I appreciate that alone time in the world, but you wouldn't covet it if it was constant. 
You wouldn't be very happy if you never had any interaction with anybody else. And God looked at the man and realized that the man was lonely and he needed something more. And so, so here's an insight to the mind of God from Genesis chapter 2. God looks at the man and says, it's not right for him to be alone. He needs someone else. Why did the man need someone else? Because he was created in the image of God. Did God need our companionship, or did God long for our companionship? And I think he longed for companionship, and so he created man. And man longed for, create, for companionship because he was created in the very image of God, and I think that was an important thing. But since man is fuller and more complete when he has a relationship with someone like himself, God made Eve. He made a companion for the man. And by the way, I, I know it's not politically correct to say it, but God made them male and female. Male and female, that's the way he made them. Neither you nor I, nor the doctors, nor the parents, nor society, nor the teachers, nor some psychologist somewhere, or anybody else assigns a person their gender. God assigns gender at conception. That's when gender is assigned. And, 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 and it's a simple fact that either you have two X chromosomes or you have an X and a Y chromosome, regardless of what you may think about yourself. It's a simple fact that God made us male and female, and, and there's no way that we can argue about that. And Eve was created to help Adam. She was not created to lead Adam. I think sometimes maybe we see that that might be one of the issues that's going on in this particular relationship. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 7 through 9. When God looked at Adam, he saw there was no helper suitable for him, so God made Eve. Her purpose is to help Adam. 1 Corinthians 11 says, The man ought not to cover his head. It's talking about head coverings there. It's been talking about women covering their head, heads when they pray. And he goes on, he says, A man ought not to cover his head, since he's the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, or for woman, depending on what translation you're reading from, but woman from or for man. Neither was the man created for woman. Again, the from is in different places, depending on which translation. But woman for or from man. So the idea was that man was created in the image of God. Woman was created for the man, is what Paul says, which fits exactly with what the text of Genesis says. It's not some new teaching. If it were a new teaching, if Paul had said, well, everybody was created exactly equal, that's not what the scriptures teach in Genesis. Paul says the woman was created for the man. And so I think we need to look at that because it sounds like a contradiction to the world we live in. In most of your modern translations of your Bible, if you read Genesis 1, verse 26, it'll say that God created mankind or humankind in his own image. That's kind of an unfortunate translation. Many people have, have, have put humankind and mankind in there uh, because... We understand the idea that, well, if, if God created man, that means male and female. But he actually created male, Adam, which is the word for man, which is also the word for mankind, which is why it can sometimes be create, confusing. But it's a masculine singular word. And then later it says, and he made them, the ones that he had just created, the masculine singular males and females. That's what the text actually says in the Hebrew. Now, not being a Hebrew scholar, I have to take the, the scholar's words for that. But if he made him all of humankind, then why would he have to say, and females? No, he made him masculine and females. That's what it says in the Hebrew as we look at this. And, and so it's sometimes, maybe intentionally, Many of our modern translations try to be more inclusive of everything. And we don't like the idea of saying that, hey, you know, there's a difference between men and women. From the very beginning in creation, there was a difference between men and women. We don't like that in the world we live in today. 
That's not popular. We, we want everybody to be exactly the same. And, and it's, it's not to say that females are any less created in the image of God, but that God intended from the start that the man should be the leader of his family. That's all it's saying. God made the man first. And then he made the woman as a helper for the man, and so the man is supposed to be the leader of the family. That's the way God intended it from the very beginning. And some will say, but that's not fair. Just because of some accident of birth, I have to be subservient to my husband. You know, that's not fair. It's not fair that I was born a woman and I have to be subservient to my husband. It's not fair that, that I was born a woman. I can't serve as an elder in the church because I was born a woman. And that's just not fair because I'm more holy than many of the men I know. And ladies, I promise you there are some of you out there who are. I promise you that's a true statement. But you know, have you ever considered that out of the 12 tribes, only the Levites were allowed to be priests? That's not fair. I was born an, a Naphtalite. Well, sorry, you can't be a priest. Well, that's not fair. I was born of the line of Judah. I'm sorry, you can't be a priest. But that's not fair. I was born with a mole on my face. I got mine removed when I was younger. I was born with a big old mole on my face. Sorry, if you got a mole on your face, you can't be a priest. But that's not fair. It's not my fault that I was born with a speech impediment. Well, I'm sorry, you can't be a priest. You see, God has always had restrictions based on birth. It's not that he loved any of the other tribes any less. Do you think God loved the tribe of Benjamin any less than he loved the tribe of Levi? I mean, you're a Benjamite, you can't be a priest. But you know what? You're a Judite, or a, someone, a Jew, a descendant of Judah. You're going to be the kings. But you know who the first king, you know what tribe they were from? Benjamin. Saul was from a Benjamite. Benjaminite, however you would say that word. Probably I would say Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. That's so easier to say. But you know, have you ever considered that it wasn't an accident of birth that you were born into the family you were born into or as the person that you were born as? That's not an accident. God intended that way. You know how I know? Let's go back and look at the story of Hannah and Elkanah. Hannah was childless, but Penea had children. And Hannah went every year, and she would pray, Lord, give me a son. Here's a question, ladies. Y'all can answer this easier than the men can. If you were barren and had no children at all, wouldn't you be just as happy if you had a daughter? If you had a child to hold and you hadn't had a child all that time, wouldn't she have been just as happy? But no, Eli said to her, God will give you a son. Before the child is even conceived, God has already determined the sex of the child. Don't you think that Rachel would have been happy just to have a baby to hold as she watched her sister have children, as she watched the servants having children, as she watched everybody in the world having children except her? Don't you think she'd have been just as happy? A healthy baby. I don't care if it's a boy or a girl. Don't you think she'd have been just as happy? But no, God told her, God gave her a son. She knew ahead of time. Don't you think Elizabeth, the one who had been barren all these years, don't you think that Sarah, who had been barren for so long that it was past the time for bearing children for her, don't you think they'd have been just as happy to hold any healthy baby? But no, even before the children were conceived, God already had determined what the sex of that child would be. And folks, God had already determined us before we were formed in the womb. He knew us. And I think that's an important thing for us to understand. Maybe you were born a male because God intended for you to be a leader in your family. And maybe you were born a female because God intended you to be able to nourish a family in a way that no man would ever be able to understand how to do. 
maybe it was a great blessing and not just an accident of birth. And I think maybe if we could understand that, the not, that's not fair part would be a whole lot less of a concern for us. But sadly, Eve goes against her divine purpose, and she wants to take the leadership position. It's, it's really pointed out more when you read the, the punishment that they have as a result of the sin. It says, and, and I've heard people ask, what does that mean of Eve that your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you? Literally, the, the words there are saying, your desire will be to rule over your husband, but he will rule over you. That's what he's saying, that the, the, the consequence of her sin is you will not be the leader because you've tried to take and usurp something that wasn't yours in the first place. And so that's what happens there. And, and, and she listens to this other voice instead of God's voice. She listens to the devil, and, and she's deceived, is what Genesis 3 and 4 through 6 say as we read about the fall. When she crossed God's boundaries, she sinned. She was supposed to be a helper for Adam, but instead she encouraged him to sin as well. You know, I think sometimes we, we, we see that, and we don't give her credit for what she did there, her part. But I think we don't give Adam credit for his part. We're going to look at that some more as we continue looking at this. She's supposed to be a helper. But instead, she was a hinderer. God's desire for women is to help your husband and family as together you journey towards heaven. That's God's desire for women. And I'm not saying like some people would say, well, you know, that means a woman can't have a career outside of the home. That's dumb. That's just dumb. Some of the ladies I know have been more successful outside the home and inside the home both and, and been able to balance both of those really, really well. It means don't abandon your home for the sake of your career, but let me tell you something. Husbands, don't abandon your family for the sake of your career. I mean, that's just, that's just a dumb argument to say it that way. Some of the smartest people I know are female. Some of the wisest people I know are female. Some of the most educated people I know are female, and, and I promise you some of the most righteous people I know are female. There's no difference in that from male and female anywhere we go down that way. But God's desire for us is different. His plan for us is different. It's a harder journey sometimes for one than the other, and it's a harder journey sometimes for the other than it was for the one. And we have to look at that. But there's a side of that, now that we've looked at that, that maybe we can see about where that first sin really came in because Eve needed Adam to lead her. I've had many wives come to me throughout my life as a minister, including my own, who have said, I really need my husband to step up and be a leader. He needs to be in the family. I need that. And guys, it's so easy for us to just abdicate everything. Oh, I went to work. I came home from work. I'm tired. I don't want to make the decisions. I don't want to be the one to decide this. I don't want to be the one to decide it. You just, you know, long as everything's going okay, it's, dinner's already on time, and, and, and we go to sleep at a decent time, and I can get up, and I can go to work, and I can watch a ball game when I want to watch a ball game. I don't really care about all the little details. You just go ahead and handle it all. I honestly believe that one of the reasons why God said that men have to serve as shepherds and deacons is because if God had not authorized for men to serve in those positions, men would have abdicated them long ago and just let the women take over everything and, and, and the church would be full of nothing but women because the men would all be hunting and fishing on the weekends. No authority. No responsive, oh, that's the big word. Guys, men, one of the most important things you have as a man is responsibility. It's not just the availability. It's the responsibility. God has given us that, the responsibility to lead your family. That is not your wife's job. That is your job. If you want your children to grow up righteous and holy and following God, that is your job as a father. Your wife is there to help, but that is your job as a father.
to be that spiritual guide in your family. By the way, if you want your wife to go to heaven, that is your job as a husband to be her spiritual guide. The problem Eve had was she didn't have a spiritual guide at home. She didn't have that. And so she decided to be the leader herself. By the way, I mean, here's the guy. He's married to the most beautiful woman on the earth. I mean, I know. She was the original Miss Universe. There was no competition for Eve. She was the prettiest girl in the whole wide world. And he's married to her, and, and, and here she's his companion. She's his partner. She's his helper, and he's supposed to be her leader. But did he? In Genesis 2, there's this narrative there where it says, The Lord God took the man, male, masculine, singular, took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, male, masculine, singular, the word in the Hebrew there is Adam, Adam. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. This was communicated to Adam before Eve was created. You ever think about that? God didn't tell Eve not to eat of the tree. He told Adam. It's Adam's responsibility to share that information with his wife, to teach his wife, and to make sure that she was following. Paul uses this example in 1 Timothy chapter 2. I, I tried to make, I don't know if the color showed up there, I tried to make a color difference there so that you can see the difference. I desire that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair, gold, pearls, or costly attire, but with what's proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. And then there's that really tough phrase that... that Sometime we'll study and, and, and see if we can't figure out what it really means. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. And, uh, and yeah, that's a difficult one sometimes to look at, and we'll do that sometime just because it deserves to be studied because it's Scripture. But the idea there is there's a difference between males and females. Paul makes this very clear. There was in creation, and there still is, and we're supposed to know that. Does it mean God loves women less than men or God loves men less than women? No, it doesn't mean that at all. What it means is that God has different plans for us, that God has different assignments for us and what we're supposed to do in life. What Adam failed to do was lead his wife. What Adam failed to do was lead his wife. He should have been, when she went there, she shouldn't have been all alone with the serpent to be tempted. Wait a minute, let's back up just a minute. When she ate of the forbidden fruit, it says she gave to her husband who was there with her. He's standing right beside her while she's being deceived. He's right there with her while she's being deceived. He's the one responsible for teaching her. He should have been saying, don't eat that. But instead, well, hey, didn't kill you? All right, I'll try it too. I'll try it too. Well, hey, you know, perfectly good for you, perfectly good for me, all good for the goose, good for the gander. But instead of being the leader, he's the follower. You know, God is longing for men to step up and lead families following after the will of God. He's crying out for that throughout Scripture as we look. You know, when we fail to follow God's plan, everything changes. It messes everything up when we fail to follow God's plan. The world turned upside down when sin entered into the world, and spiritual death came as a result of sin. They died spiritually immediately when they were separated from God by their sin. They died spiritually Physical death came in. They were driven out of the garden so that they might not eat of the tree of, of life and live forever. So 
spiritual, our physical death came as a result of sin. The perfect world, incorrupted world, the world of innocence, the world of perfection, the world of beauty, the world of no thorns. Can you imagine? I'm looking back there to see if I see Rusty and I don't see him back there. Can you imagine if you could plant your crops and know that they're going to grow? You don't have to worry about weeds. You don't have to worry about rain. You don't have to worry about whether you're going to get enough sunshine. You don't have to worry about it. Your crops are just going to flourish. No pests. No anything. Can you imagine how the farmers would thrive if that could happen? How wonderful that would be. Oh, but no. Because of sin, the whole earth came under a curse. And later on, Paul's going to write in Romans chapter 8 that all of creation groans as a result of sin in the world that we live in. You know, there's always going to be contrary voices. There's always going to be somebody that will come up and say, oh, God didn't really mean that. There's always going to be somebody that will come up and say, well, you won't surely die. There's always going to be somebody that will come up and say, now, look, there's all kinds of good reasons why you ought to go ahead and do this, even though God told you not to do it. Don't listen to them. Just don't listen to those voices. You know, that's, that's the problem. There's, there's always going to be people. There's always going to be family. There's always going to be friends. There's always going to be society. There's always going to be counselors. There's always going to be someone that are going to speak contrary to the will of God. Just don't listen to them. That's the easy way to solve that. God has spoken to us through Jesus. Maybe we ought to just listen to him. You know, Hebrews 1 and verse 2 says that he's spoken to us through his son and that we ought to, and, and, and I'm pretty sure, no, I know for a fact, that on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Moses and Elijah are there, and you look and you say, hey, wow, here's the law and the prophets, and God said, this is my son. Hear him. Listen to Jesus. Listen to his words. Listen to his teachings. And you know, his teachings are pretty easy. This is part of that transfiguration narrative. He was still speaking. A bright cloud overshadowed. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Hear him. You know, and as our favorite storyteller would say probably, I don't know, y'all may not like Paul Harvey, but I think many do. Somebody said last night, says, so how many people do you think even know who Paul Harvey is? I think, I said, probably most. And now, for the rest of the story. You know, are you impressed with this first impression of the first couple? Before we become too judgmental of Adam and Eve, let's look at ourselves for just a minute because the truth of the matter is we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I have and you have. That's the truth of the matter. How would you like it if your sins were in the very beginning of the most read book of all time for everybody forever to know about your sins. I mean, how would you like that? Aren't you glad that God doesn't put your sins up on a big billboard for everybody to see? I mean, aren't you glad of that? I am. I am so thankful for that. Aren't you glad that God has a plan for forgiveness? And aren't you glad for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ? I uh, had thought at this point that I would try to lead a song. And I said, well, I'm not sure everybody knows it. And then when I tried to practice it, I'm not sure I know it well enough to lead it for sure. But I want to read just a few words from this song. It's called God Give Us Christian Homes. We used to sing this when I was growing up, and I haven't sang it in a long time because... Uh, that's just one that has fallen by the wayside maybe sometime. God give us Christian homes, homes where the Bible is loved and taught, homes where the master's will is sought, homes crowned with beauty thy love hath wrought. God give us Christian homes, homes where the father is true and strong, homes that are free from the blight of wrong, homes that are joyous with love and song. Homes where the mother in queenly quest strives to show others thy way is best. Homes where the Lord is an honored guest. Homes where the children are led to know Christ in his beauty who loves them so. 
Homes where the altar fires burn and glow, God give us Christian homes. And Christian homes start with a father who leads his family. Christian homes continue with a mother who is a helpful helper and a comfort in her family. And Christian homes conclude with children who are raised up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord to obey their parents in the Lord in everything because that pleases God. May God give us Christian homes. Maybe today it's time for you to come back to God. Maybe you've wandered astray. Maybe it's time for you to come to him for the first time. Maybe it's time to put Jesus on in baptism. Maybe today is the day that you speak to your spouse and say, hey, you know what, honey? I need to rededicate myself to our family and to fulfilling what God intends for me to be as a husband or as a wife, as a father, as a child. Whatever your need may be, if you need to respond, we invite you to do so as we stand and sing to encourage you.